Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's edition of Kibitzing with Kagan, brief conversations with people I find fascinating. My very special guest today is Secretary Laura Herrera Scott of the Maryland Department of Health. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for taking time to chat. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for your career of service and leadership. Uh, so I want to give folks a brief idea of your background. So after you got your master's in public health at Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Health, among the things you've done are working in the medical corps and the army reserve. Talk about that was what that was like and give people an idea of, of the responsibilities of that, and especially as a woman. Sure. So, you know, I signed on the dotted line for the military to help pay for my very large uh, student loan debt, uh, especially for medical school. Um, the Army gave me lots of opportunities to not only serve our own armed forces, but then certainly during at least one of my deployments, um, took care of uh, others uh, when I went overseas uh, to Iraq. So um, was in the reserves for 10 years, deployed three times from 2004 to 2008, the first two times stateside and the third one overseas. Amazing. Thank you. That's a lot of sacrifice. Thank you. Um, so then you also, after working as the National Director of Women Veterans Healthcare and all that, you journeyed your way to Maryland and to, um, and to our government. How did you first meet Westmore? And tell us the story of how you uh, became his nominee. So um, I will call it as, describe it as serendipity. Um, so prior to joining the Moore Miller administration, I was in the private sector. I worked for a very large national payer and then for short term at Summit Health, which is a multi-physician specialty group um, in New York, New Jersey. But I just didn't feel satisfied with the work that I was doing. It was the first time in my career that those six years that I had gone to work in the uh, private sector. And I was really looking for a change. So I just quit my job because I was looking for more meaning and then had been following along the uh, Moore Miller campaign, um, was very excited to hear him speak and his vision and, um, you know, started whispering, hey, you know, where are we with the secretary and could I get my name on the list? And um, so I took a very active uh, role in trying to get in front of uh, Governor Moore and his team at the time. And here I am. Amazing. Very fortunate to be here. Yes. Amazing. So tell me about getting the call. Um, so when I first got the call, I was, you know, to, to, to interview, I was super excited. But when I got the call, yeah. one, I didn't recognize the number, so I almost didn't pick up. <laughs> and then two, when I answered it, because I thought it was a telemarketer, it was more of like, hello, not like, <laughs> Hello. Oh right. my God. <laughs> and then um, when he told me my family was there because my kids were home for the holidays. And so we just celebrated. And I think I actually started crying because I was so excited by the news. So yes. amazing. Well, you are also so talented, so committed and doing such a great job already. Tell me what your biggest challenge was coming in. So the Department of Health seems like I mean, first off, it was on the front line through COVID. So what did you inherit from the Hogan administration? What was really good and what was your biggest challenge coming in? So I will say the biggest challenge is people were tired, right? They were beaten down on multiple levels, not only by the way the prior administration governed this agencies, but just the sheer cadence related to COVID. Right. Um, our vacancy factor was over 20% in some areas of the department. So we really had... Um, uh, key workforce shortages, especially in the leadership. Um, and then it was also changing the culture. There was uh, very much a culture of fear. You didn't speak up. Mm. Um, and so really trying to say we're one team. Um, I try to lead by consensus. Your input is invaluable to us. Um, and, and getting um, the team to operate as a team as opposed to the silos that they operated before. So, so those were some of the biggest challenges. But I want to say for the team that I do have, what a bunch of dedicated um, clinicians, public servants that are absolutely committed to serving all Marylanders. Yay. Yay for them. Yay for you. Um, 
Do you consider us, us in a post-COVID world? How, how present does COVID feel to you in 2023? So COVID is still present and it's not going to be going away. And yes, I think about us as a post-COVID world. And I also think about it as one of the infectious diseases that we're going to now have to manage. And I put that in line with influenza and people are used to getting their annual flu shot. And some people might be familiar with respiratory respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, which has predominantly been a virus that's impacted young children, but now we know it impacts older adults as well. So I, I think we're trying to normalize COVID um, and getting screened for COVID when you think you're symptomatic, as well as certainly getting immunized now that we're going into respiratory virus season. Yes, yes, yes. How are you doing public education and outreach in a way that reminds people this is safe, this is important. Um, I think we're doing it as part of our regular flu campaign and respiratory virus season. So a lot of information is going out through the local health departments. Our managed care organizations are certainly reminding our um, Medicaid beneficiaries and our primary care practices are certainly aware that this is the time by virtue of the fact that they're carrying the vaccines and providing that in their offices. Also, we've made it easier than we've ever made it before. You can go to your local pharmacy and get these um, prescriptions I mean, get these immunizations so you don't have to take time off from work to get them. You can just go to your local Walgreens or CVS. Um, yes, fabulous. Um, there are hard to reach populations. And you and I have talked before about what I call language access. And my legislative district in Gaithersburg and Rockville is among the most linguistically diverse legislative districts in the country. Uh, how are we reaching people for whom English is not their primary language? We do, I think, a pretty good job with Spanish, but I would say for languages outside of that, we really rely on our community-based organizations to tell us where there's pockets of individuals that need different kinds of messaging. Um, so we do have work to do in that space. I think even our Spanish language translation sometimes misses the mark as well. So that's certainly um, a core focus for me as the leader of this administration to, to improve the way we message outside of English. So you talked about community-based organizations or nonprofit organizations, uh, which are so important to reach into communities. Give an example or two as to how you engage and how they help reach into various communities, geographically, ethnically, socioeconomically. So, um, you know, the faith-based organizations were a key partner during COVID, quite frankly, without some of the work that they did and the trust that the community has with their faith leaders, we would have not successfully immunized as many people as we did during COVID. So how do we leverage that stickiness that people have with their uh, faith-based leaders, their other community organizations that they recognize um, for getting their health information and then taking action on their health information? And we either fund those organizations directly or through our local health departments or our local behavioral health authorities? So we've been working on making our relationships with nonprofits to run more efficiently. And the comptroller in your department and many other departments have been involved with um, prompt payment uh, as well as um, efficient grant applications and all that. Um, Anything you want to say about our the efforts to streamline it to facilitate their work? So we're certainly working on the efficient grant application. I would not describe us as very efficient right now. Um, and that is something that we are working on cleaning up, especially because our community partners rely on those grants to make payroll. And so I'm very sensitive to that. And so we are looking at our end-to-end -end process and it will be... Um, we did better this year than I understand we did it last year. And my goal is to do even better to get all of our grants, if not most of our grants out before the end of the start of the fiscal year. Great. And by that, I mean like July. So. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. And that sensitivity and awareness helps drive the change. Mm -hmm. And I just have to give a shout out to our comptroller, Brooke Learman. Uh, she and her team have been great partners in all of this in facilitating that. So I just want to. Um, so let's 
pivot um, to Maryland's ranking on healthcare delivery. Um, it is astonishing. I suspect most people watching this or listening to this would be shocked to hear that Maryland ranked 50th, dead last among states, um, based on the length of time of wait time that um, in healthcare emergency rooms. Um, and that was largely due a, to a shortage in personnel. Now, we just passed, um, I, I uh, sponsored a bill that Governor Moore signed uh, with delegate Leslie Lopez, Delegate uh, Chair Jocelyn Pena Melnick, to allow people who are not yet citizens to get healthcare licensure. And that's going to allow us to bring more people uh, into the healthcare field and hopefully shorten wait times. And I'm sorry, this is a long question, but I want to give a, a setup. Um, how important is that? How are we pushing that out and educating folks so they know they have another career opportunity, a possible path? So, I mean, you know, we're doing everything we can because workforce shortages in general um, for any specialty is an issue for all states. Um, yes. I'm not, you know, many people just left the profession during and certainly after COVID and the pipeline that's coming in is not sufficient to meet the demand in the delivery system. Yes. Um, so we're doing as much as we can on not only educating on that, but just workforce in general and understanding uh, what we have today and how to create the pipeline. And as for the ED wait times, we are certainly working with the Maryland Hospital Association and the hospitals and the work that they're doing um, to not only understand their root cause for each facility, you can't treat them as one big um, system of care, um, but where are the opportunities to streamline services um, to improve those wait times. Because for many people, despite our greatest attempts to connect people to primary care, the ED sometimes is their first place for accessing health care. And if they can't get it there, then they're not getting health care anywhere. ED, like a ER, emergency. Yes, department. emergency department. Yes. Um, so I was just with a nonprofit leader um, who does job training for 10 to 15,000 people a year, and he hadn't heard about the bill yet, which made me so frustrated because he's an old friend of mine. Uh, the rolling out is really a challenge, but we can end up with ethnically and linguistically diverse workforce in the health, uh, in our health fields. So yes, it's a big opportunity for us, for sure. And for us, I mean, the state of Maryland and the healthcare workforce. Totally. Um, you oversee through your department a lot of boards, professional health occupations board, and some of them, with all due respect to those who serve, some of them are have kind of a terrible reputation. And as legislators, we're always trying to advocate for our constituents. People have been offered a job, but they can't get their nursing license or something. How big a challenge? How, how are you making progress yet on streamlining? So, so we're certainly working with the Board of Nursing, as you know, legislation passed earlier this year that has the Board of Nursing as a direct report of the Maryland Department of Health. So not as a dotted line, but as a solid line. And so we are actively working with the Board of Nursing. We have gotten them connected to their IT infrastructure, which they weren't before, which was impacting their ability to serve nurses and, and the need for nursing license, as well as uh, nursing assistance. Um, we're working on uh, what I will refer to or not refer to what is a major IT development project, which is specifically around the licensing software that they use um, so that we can streamline licensing and more of it can be done virtually. So you don't have to go into the office of the Board of Nursing to um, work through your licensing issues that you'll be able to do everything electronically uh, once we have this new licensing system on in place. Um, we've named a uh, new executive director, and we're certainly working up uh, with the new executive director, Rhonda Scott, on staffing key leadership positions um, so that we can streamline processes. And, and certainly from my view, we're using that as a blueprint of how we should make sure all the boards are operating yes. and what are the opportunities and the other boards based on the lessons learned from the board of nursing. Great. Amen. Good job. Um, so there's, you referenced legislation. So let's talk about a few other uh, legislative initiatives that passed. Let's start with cannabis. Uh, recreational cannabis for adults became legal in Maryland on July 1st. 
How does a health department talk about that? So we've been certainly working on uh, educational campaigns and what that means, um, as well as even, you know, some of the negative effects of even recreational use of cannabis. And we are in the process of developing a database to start tracking some of that. You know, there's plenty of lessons learned from other states that have preceded us in the legalization of cannabis. Yes. Um, and so what are those lessons learned that we know we want us track? from day one. Um, and so that's where we are right now. So not only is it education around cannabis use, recreational or otherwise, treatment options, if you think you have a problem, but also how are we gonna track outcomes um, moving forward? That's great. So I think you and I have talked about DUID, driving under the influence of drugs, uh, which is a very serious concern of mine that I've raised on the Senate floor many times. Um, are you working with the Department of Transportation at all to track, yes, driving while impaired? Yes. So we've, Secretary Wiedefeld and I had a discussion very early on, shortly after it was legalized, as especially as we were talking about the, the data that we want to be tracking. And it's certainly on their radar as well. Um, so we're also talking about educational campaigns in partnership. We haven't um, defined exactly what that looks like, but we've had several discussions on the need for both of us to be tracking that information and education as well. That's great. And I know the Maryland State Police are interested in watching this and, and many others. Uh, let's talk about uh, other legislation that passed this year, which was about abortion care and trans health care. Can you talk about how the department is starting to roll those out? So certainly for the abor abortion care, um, we um, just released um, dollars for training. Um, so, you know, uh, abortion care is women's health care. And so we want to make sure all women, um, not just women in Maryland, but but all women have access um, to that service. And so in order to do that, back to the workforce issue, we need more clinicians trained to provide that service. And so we are working with um, several um, groups right now to expand education and training so that we have the adequate workforce to provide that. And certainly on the trans equity bill, uh, you know, as the Medicaid or the provider of Medicaid as a payer of services, um, we are working with our managed care organizations um, to make sure that those services are paid for. Now, I think we still have a workforce issue and having providers with specialty, you know, specialty knowledge in this space. Um, so that work is underway as well, I identifying the workforce and the network so that um, um, people who need those services can access those services because if we, even if we say we'll pay for it, if we don't have an adequate network, they still won't be able to get the services. So that's something we're working on as well. Absolutely. And people may not be aware that medical schools over the past, I don't know, a couple of decades have, have made it uh, an elective to learn about abortion care or even not or uh, offering it in their um, curriculum. And that has led to the problem of, of the shortage. So yay, Maryland, for being out there to provide women this vital health care. Well, especially as you think about, you know, residency training programs in other yeah. states where this is not allowed, the number of clinicians that would have the skill set to do that will shrink over time if we don't um, intervene today. So yeah. No, great. Totally important. Um, so when we think healthcare, a lot of times we think physical healthcare. Let's talk about mental health care, behavioral health. Certainly young people during COVID have really struggled, but so many of us have struggled. Can you talk about what you're doing in that area? So we are in a crisis, I would say, between the social isolation, between the changes in people's lives, um, between social media and the 24-7 uh, coverage of information, um, even the algorithms that tee up certain information that's certainly not good for, for people's mental health, let alone their physical health. Um, so we are um, actively, this has been a priority in the 10 months that I've been in this role, 
building out a behavioral health framework and by behavioral health, it, it's mental health and substance use, but building out a behavioral health framework that, that meets the needs of all our Marylanders. I would say we have a lot of work to do in the children's space, again, because of the workforce issues. We don't have enough services and enough providers to provide those services. And even in the adult space, um, we have enough in some jurisdictions, certainly in our more uh, urban um, counties, but in our in rural Rural Maryland, we have some work that needs to be done, but it's absolutely a priority. We know people are in crisis and really, really struggling. Um, we do have our 988 line. Um, so I want to remind people that that's an opportunity if you feel like you need someone to talk to and, and you're just not finding the care that you need. Certainly your primary care provider, um, many primary care providers or most primary care providers are well-versed in managing anxiety and depression and for more acute disorders can work with you to get you care. Our faith-based leaders have been, like I said earlier, incredible partners in connecting people to the delivery system. So if you need help, there are multiple, multiple places to get it. But, but first and foremost, you can start with 988 if you're not sure where to go. 988 was literally my next question. So thank you. Suicide and Crisis Hotline, it's free. It's anywhere in the state. And there are people ready to listen and offer support. Um, the other three digit numbers that I work closely and intently on are 911, 211, and 311. Why don't you talk about how the Department of Health engages with some of those? So we work, we don't do as much work with um, 311. With 911, we're certainly working with them as it relates to behavioral health crisis. So how do we work with the 911 system if it's not an emergency to transfer those calls and work with the 988 system? And we're doing the same with 211. So there are some wraparound services that 211 provides that 988 doesn't. And so we're really trying to get the landscape of who's doing what to streamline it for the resident or the patient or the client that needs those services because because of the number of numbers we have it's confusing to um, people of maryland on which number do i call and if i call the wrong number will i still get the help i need so so we're working on our end to streamline that make the messaging clear of uh when to call 988 versus 911. so um as you know, I've been working on 911 for a long time and have legislation to merge 211 and 311 to make sure, but the bottom line is no wrong door. No matter right. which three digit number, your call can be transferred and you can get the help you need. So whether it's what day is my recycling picked up? When, where can I get a COVID shot? My house is literally on fire. I'm feeling depressed. I need a bed for tonight, whatever it is, we're going to be able to help you. And, uh, but it's, it's still a journey. Yes. Um, so uh, you talked about the crisis and you talked about rural areas and it's a real challenge. Uh, Special secretary for opioids, Emily Keller has been doing a lot of work on, uh, on that crisis with fentanyl and stuff. Uh, talk about maybe one initiative that you're working on uh, to deal with the opioid crisis. So we have lots of initiatives. So we have a whole harm reduction team that works on exactly what it means on, on harm reduction activities, which does anything from needle exchange um, to our wound care nurses. So certainly with the fentanyl over, you know, epidemic, we're seeing wounds that are very different than the wounds we saw from um, heroin. And so how do we manage those wounds, which tend to be more complex, um, um, decompensate very quickly, um, and even to testing strips. So uh, providing um, people who use the ability to know if their uh, drug of choice has been tainted with fentanyl. So they're aware of the warnings, certainly Narcan. Um, so, um, you know, working closely with um, uh, Emily Keller and uh, her team as part of uh, MDH proper and all the work that we're doing related to harm reduction, but also to screening and treatment, right? So, so if people are ready, we certainly want to have an avenue for them to access treatment if they're ready. And if they're not ready, then how do we keep them safe in the meantime? Yes. 
So I just talked to Secretary Keller uh, just the other day, actually, about the testing strips, because I was so curious about those. So if someone is going to use, they can find out whether fentanyl is in the drug. And there are other also like horse tranquilizers and stuff that can kill you, not just give you a high, but can kill you. So and naloxone or Narcan, uh, making that more available and getting folks trained in how that works is is fundamentally important. Um, Madam Secretary, is there any uh, other health issue that I haven't asked about that you want to talk about before we go to the fast five? No, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about maternal child health. And, and certainly what we know is an epidemic of, around our women of color not getting the care that they need. And we're seeing not only um, increasing complications during delivery, but certainly in some cases, death of both mom and or baby. And so we are actively um, engaged with uh, uh, understanding our delivery system, how to make it better. Uh, Medicaid is now um, paying for doula care. Um, so doulas to support uh, moms during delivery. So a lot of work happening there. And also big, um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, we're in the middle of Medicaid redeterminations. So during the public health emergency unwinding, people enrolled in Medicaid did not have to reapply for their benefits. And now that that public health emergency has ended, uh, we have a 12 month window to have everyone re-enroll in their Medicaid benefits. So if you get an email, if you get a letter, and if you're not sure, call our health benefit exchange phone number, but we wanna make sure you keep your coverage in Medicaid so you can access the health services that you and your family need. And what happens if they don't do it, if they miss the deadline? If they miss the deadline, then they're at risk of getting disenrolled from Medicaid and then not having health care coverage. Why am I foreseeing hearing from constituents after the fact and needing? Oh my gosh. Well, okay. we're doing a lot of work in communities. We've also highlighted um, communities where we know we are seeing what I what is referred to as procedural uh, um uh, denials or um, so, and then we're blitzing those communities where we're seeing higher numbers than the general average and doing more education and more outreach and working with our community partners to get the word out. And I want to just give a shout out to the managed care organizations because they've been great partners in helping the department to get the word out. And again, trying to keep as many people who are eligible for Medicaid enrolled in Medicaid. Fantastic. Uh, wow. I'm exhausted just hearing about all the tests you got. Um, but we're going to wrap up. And uh, as you know, it's time for now the fast five, five quick questions, five quick answers okay. on really random topics. And a shout out to my interns who came up with some of these questions. So question number one, uh, because of your background in the military, which action or war movie do you think is uh, offers the most realistic portrayal based on your experience? Oh, that's a hard one. I know. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to go on the comedic side um, because I wasn't necessarily the best soldier, even though I thought I was a great doctor in the military and also date myself and say Private Benjamin. OK, yay, Goldie Hawn. OK, Montgomery County local girl here. Uh, question number two, if you could be a contestant on any game show, which would you choose? One that you think you would do pretty well in? The Amazing Race. Nice. Question three, you have a terribly stressful job. What do you do to relax? Um, we're big hikers and cyclists, which I understand you are as well. So um, any chance I get to be outside and look at pretty things and enjoy nature, that's what I do to relax. Fantastic. And Maryland has a lot of beautiful parks. and hikes. Yes, we do. Yes, so we do. Uh, question four, what's an item on your bucket list that you haven't yet done that you're willing to share here? Well, I've been systematically checking off my bucket list items, um, and I just checked one off. So uh, I don't Tell have us that one. one. If you like, uh, I just recently was in Scotland and I hiked Ben Nevis, which is forty five hundred feet of elevation. So um, yeah, I, I I I think life is a gift, and so I don't wait to check off bucket list items. I'm checking them off as we go. Amen. I love that. And question number five, Maryland Department of Health Secretary Laura Herrera-Scott, what is your hidden secret superpower? 
What's a skill or talent you have, something you're really good at that most folks can't do? In general or specific to this role? As you like. Um, I would say specific to this role, I have, I think I've been fortunate to have an eye for talent and I have built arguably one of the best sub cabinets in all of Maryland government and feel incredibly fortunate to have the team that I have working for me. Uh, personally, um, I hear I can decorate very well. <laughs> So. Nice. I have gotten that answer once before. I'm so impressed by the uh, the visual and artistic talent on our cabinet. Um, well, Madam Secretary, thank you for all that you're doing to lead our state, keep us healthy, keep us educated as to how we can stay well. And uh, I don't, okay, I'm going to be trekky for a moment. Live long and prosper? I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. So thank you. A real pleasure. I look forward to seeing you soon. Stay well. Take Thank care. Thank you. You too. Bye.